Hello, everybody. Hello, hello. Welcome to a Reaper Pro Tips, and I am your host, Anne, along with disembodied voice Justin. And apparently, Twitch is twitchy today. Um, Justin said the rehost function is supposedly a bit um, under the weather, so if things start going weird, please let us know. Uh, no, no dumpster today. I did not prime it yesterday. I, uh, I have, I have honestly, I've just not been tracking great. I had to get a bunch of stuff done for my Patreon, so uh, I did not. Uh, actually prime as the dumpster. Also, I kind of wanted to work on the skin tones and, you know, get the skin tones done on this guy before we switch topics. Uh, otherwise, it's just like we base code and shadow and then we just go away for a while and then we come back, nobody remembers what we were doing in the first place. Um, but yeah. So I guess dumpster might be tomorrow. I have him, uh, I have it uh, mostly ready to go. I also have to review some of my uh, techniques that I want to use on it. So yeah, good morning everybody. I have not been sleeping great because Kiri has been restless, so I am like, Ugh. so it's a sleepy Wednesday for Anne. <laughs> I definitely will need a power nap this afternoon. Let's just put that together. I might even need an extra power nap this morning after stream because Little Miss Dog has been uh, highly disruptive to my sleep schedule for the last several days. So woo, <laughs> it's one of those days. So yeah, we're working on Fire Giant King again, and I am going to have to remix all my colors from yesterday, thus demonstrating that really it's not an emergency if you have to remix a complicated color. Hey, Image of Betrayal, thank you for the sub, the resub. Three months. You're on a streak. Awesome. Oh, RZ masks, uh, Threads of Fate, RZ, RZ. This is my stylish lavender, although it looks a little blue on camera. My stylish lavender one. This is for airbrushing. I've worn it in a pinch for uh, for COVID, um, but I also have a, a plain cloth one with it, with dogs and cats on it that I wear for COVID that I like a little bit better. It's less a little less sinister looking. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, good morning, good morning everybody. Good sleepy morning. Whew. Alrighty, let's see here. Let us get this, some of this stuff out of my way and. Get Mr. Fire Giant on cam, and yeah, let's just rock it. Let's see here. We were using Dungeon Dwellers paints yesterday. I've been doing a lot of Dungeon Dwellers lately because I've been wanting to run them through their paces a bit. So I'm going to remix up our uh, skin tone from yesterday. Let's get that all in focus. Let's see here. Keeping an eye, hoping we're not going to have a Kiri emergency today. Ooh, that's close. Well, we'll go back for mixing. Ah, oh wow, I can zoom in even farther. Ah, all right. Sorry, getting you guys totally uh, discombobulated with the camera motion this morning. Let's see here. I believe we had six drops. And if you're going to do complex mixes like this, it always helps if you keep a little painting journal or a notepad or something that, are, that you can write down your mixes on. This will be a great help to you later. And then we add three drops of the orange, two drops of the red. One, two, three. And it's okay to build a giant paint puddle like this because I'm going to take part of it to, off to the side and mill, build highlights with it. Two drops of the kobold scale. And then two drops of eldritch. Yeah, the fire giants are good. Good evening, Jenna Rose. Yeah, I, I, uh, I feel like it's evening, even though it's morning. Alrighty. Let's take our, let's see, where's my crappy mixing brush? There. Mix up this puddle of weird into the skin tone that we were using yesterday. And then, once we have all our puddle of weird mixed up, we will begin to make it into a highlight. Alright, there's our puddle of weird. Close enough, really. And uh, yesterday we were mixing it with some blue liner to give it, it definitely, perp the blue liner definitely takes it more purpley. It, uh, it definitely takes it from the normal brown there to, uh, to a more purple color there. And then I think for a highlight, I want to add actually even more, a bit more orange and probably a drop of white or off-white. When I'm mixing uh, so many colors together, I usually just go for pure white 
an off white is is gonna the touch of pigment that's in an off white really is not going to impact your uh, your results. The only way it will impact it is by not having as much white pigment. So I mean that is something that you may prefer. We'll see. I don't mind his skin tone going orange because he's gonna have orange hair anyway. And also any light sources around him might be fire based. So going a bit orange is not a big deal. Um, in addition, uh, yeah, he's got orange hair anyway, so it's going to work. Uh, in addition, if I go with bluish, like a blue black armor, which I tend to like to do on fire giants, uh, that'll be complementary to our orange. So it'll look good. Yeah, this is a nice fire giant. I mean, he's a, he's a big honking dude. He's huge, just like his, uh, his name says, um, but yeah, so here here we are. That's actually a pretty good highlight color, I think. I might put down some blue liner just in case I have to touch up some shadows. Hey, Carrie Cosby. Thanks for the prime sub and welcome to the stream. I'm Anne, if you haven't seen me before. It's nice to meet you. So blue liner, which is 9066. I'm just going to drop six drops in. I tend to work in six, six or eight drop puddles because that lets me um, make a deep enough puddle that my paint stays wet for a while. I'm gonna put two drops and thin it pretty much three to one. That's gonna make it very thin, but it, it means that uh, I'll be able to kind of mix with it and glaze with it without it being really heavy. The liners go a little bit transparent when you add a lot of water to them. This can be to your advantage if you're trying to blend smoothly. Yeah, technically my birthday was halfway halfway through the year, I guess. Well, actually, is it? Yeah, yeah, I guess halfway through the year, yeah, because it's like the first six months. Although, is it really halfway through the year? I mean, number of days in the months, or is it just like an approximation? Whatever. Happy July, everybody. How about that? Feels so weird to be in July. All right, I am going to grab my brush with a tip and move his little name banner out of the way. And I'm thinking I probably need to thin my highlight a bit more. You can see when you use a well palette, you can get a really good idea of how thin or thick your paint is by looking at how it falls off the side here. I can't really see any of the white porcelain through the way that this is falling off the side. That's probably because I added some pure white. Pure white adds a lot of coverage. So if I really want this to be able to like layer, for example, for wet blending, this is fine. But if I want it to layer, I need it to go thinner. And I may end up wet blending with it anyway, just because we're on stream and it's faster. But once you do that, now you can see, you can see a little bit of the palette through it, right? So that shows you that you're getting a bit more transparency and that's how, uh, how much it's going to cover when you start adding it to the model. Approximation, haven't counted. That's okay, Carly Hamster. If you had counted, I would think that maybe you'd gone a bit far. Happy Canada Day? Is it Canada Day? Yeah, if we count like weird time inflation due to pandemic and all the other weirdness that's going on, I'm pretty sure the last three months have been a year and then <laughs> this year would end up being four years long. Weird time effects. Let's talk to Doctor Who about that and say, dude, like totally make this year a bit shorter. Alrighty, let's see here. Going to kind of rebase with these fingers because I had a little bit of rub off. That's a bit thick. I think I want another drop of water. It's base coat thick and at this point I don't want it base coat thick. I want it to, one, I want it to stick around for a little while. I'm going to add a couple of drops of water into there. My water bottle is almost empty. I will need to refill. So I'm making this a bit more fluid so that I can blend with it and uh, layer with it without leaving a lot of brush strokes. We're all traveling at relativistic speeds. It's all relative to our own mind frame, right? If we want to get really, really weird and physics-y about it. Pretty sure that Einstein would... Or philosophical, even. Yeah. Well, uh, philosophy and high-level physics are very intertwined. Like, logic logic and science are, in, are uh, like inextricably intertwined, actually. Yeah, I would say you can't really have one without the other. Yeah, I mean, scientific method was created because philosophy needed a way to talk about stuff that couldn't see, so, or couldn't couldn't figure out how to prove, so. 
I've been watching a lot of uh, like ancient civilization stuff here recently, just because oh, yeah. it's intrigued me, and uh, I'll just binge watch all kind of, everything I can get my hands on. Uh huh. Um, and read stuff. And I was reading a lot about Archimedes, and uh, although not a obviously not a philosopher, but a uh, an inventor, he was insane. The dude was was kind of like one of a kind for his time. Yep. Yep. Yeah, a lot of people don't realize how intertwined how philosophy was like the foundation for a lot of our scientific method and everything. So it is true, even though a lot of people have, we've been trained to kind of look at philosophy with kind of a you know down our noses attitude. At least that's the way it was uh, much presented to me in college because I took a lot of philosophy courses because I was interested in it. Um, and the 200 level course is logic. So they kind of throw a bunch of words at you for the 101 course. And then when you get to 201, it's, uh, it's the tons of logic, uh, and you learn hopefully how to critically think about things. It was a useful class. Um, Jenky, I would say this guy has got to be at least uh, 75. We were talking yesterday. He's about the same size as a 75 millimeter model. Let me see. I've actually got a ruler with millimeters on it right next to me. So let's see. Let's see how he is. I'm going to bet. Yeah, it's close. It might be 75 mil, actually. Almost 80 mil. Uh, if you count from his shoulders down to the bottom of his foot, he is exactly 80 millimeters tall. So, yes, he is very close to a 75 millimeter model. Um, which means that we're, when we're painting him and when we're highlighting him, we can keep that in mind because you don't necessarily want to shade as darkly, um, or if you do want to shade as darkly, you, uh, you want to, uh, blend it in cunningly. Um, the thing with larger models is they tend to catch, cast more, more natural shadows, whereas a 28 millimeter model, uh, does not. Let me get close here. Boink. And now let's get really in focus. Let's see here. There we go. So I'm going to start working on the knuckles here, and I'm starting to do some little slashes to suggest... Uh... There we go. But yeah, he's a big, big guy. Let me just take... I'm going to take this right off, actually. Since I'm working on the hand, I may as well work on the hand. So I want to highlight up here, and uh, I also want to suggest some texture that's not even here, which is uh, there'd normally probably be wrinkles here on the knuckles. And I want to suggest those. And I want to lighten up the area as it gets toward the top of the knuckle. So I'm using a layering brush stroke here, which means I'm starting my brush stroke and then pulling the paint back up toward where I actually want things to be lighter. To do this, you have to you have to thin your paint, um, and your success with layering will depend on how close your colors are together. These colors are like fairly far apart, but I've also thinned this one a lot. So kind of your guidelines when you're trying to blend are going to be the closer together your colors are, the thicker you can leave your paint and still get a blend. But the farther apart your colors are, the more you're going to have to thin the paint and do this layering stroke and build up layers, which is why it's called layering, um, in order to get a blend. So if I'm trying to make a blend as the light comes, see this is a nice blend from dark to light now on this, uh, this set of knuckles. Um, if I want to get this, the important thing is brush stroke and how much you thin your paint. Let's see here. Well, I think we're talking like, what? what is our calendar? The Roman calendar? I forget. But I think, I'm pretty sure Dark Angel that uh, we are not uh, talking about the Chinese calendar, which would totally change everything. But the... Uh, yeah, we're talking about the 365-day calendar created by Julius Caesar, correct? Uh, yeah, I think that's why it's called the Roman calendar. It was it Julius, really? It was actually. That's wow, I had I no idea. Before. I had no idea that Julius gave us this calendar. 
So does that mean like we should totally like praise him or we should totally like yell at him? Like he should have given us more well, days. They did in the same documentary refer to him as a dictator in a lot of ways. So correct. It's the one that numbers the day. So 365 days. Uh, the fact that we have 365 days in a year is, is attributable to. So blame it on, blame it on Julius. I see. All right. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah, all those Caesars, like, said that, you know, everybody, all those Romans said they had a republic when actually it was uh, a lot more. Like, there was a reason that Caesar was murdered, let's just... Because <laughs> he, he was, wasn't he, I believe? So, uh, one thing is, is curious to me, though, and, and if someone in chat, please, 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 if you have some material for this. Um, I was looking, and, and, and of all the stuff I've been, I've been looking at a lot of, like, um, ancient civilizations, including, obviously, the Romans, the... Uh, the Greek, the, you know, hell, even some of the, the Middle Eastern, like Egypt, like a lot of the civilizations are really interesting and intriguing to me. Um, but I can't find a whole lot dedicated to just Rome. And Rome has, has definitely intrigued me a lot more than, for instance, the fall of Rome. <clears throat> oh, there's know. an excellent book. There's an excellent book. It's dry, but it's, um, it's, I believe it is actually called The Rise and Fall of the Roman Empire. Really? Okay. Yeah, I think so. Um, you might even be able... I wonder if it's on audiobook, because I think it's a pretty famous book. Um, I used to own it in um, in book form. Um, it's useful... As a writer, it's useful for when you're trying to envision those big situations, uh, big uh, civilizations, to kind of have realistic uh, representations of them so that you kind of know uh, how things went. So, uh, yeah... Yeah, Rise and Fall of... Yeah, so there we go. Jedi, yep. Other, other people in chat say pick up the Rise and Fall of the Ro Roman Empire. There we go. But yeah, if you're really interested, I don't know if it's on audiobook. That would be interesting if it was on audiobook. With drier books, I find that an audiobook can really make them more listenable. But I don't know what your preferences are as far as book books or audiobooks, Justin. I, I, I like audiobook. I mean... Audiobooks, I feel like it's easier for me to streamline with the rest of my life and all the crap I have going on. Right. Um, however, I do enjoy a good book, so if it's only available in book, I'll read it. Also, thank you, Miniatures Den, for that uh, for that contribution there. That's that's neat. Yeah, that's that's one of the things that intrigued me was the number of leaders that the Roman Empire had that all had different kind of. <laughs> Every time they talk about any one of them, they're all referring to how they almost bankrupted the Roman Empire. <laughs> <laughs> same thing with same thing with the with the uh with the Egyptian culture too. It's it's you know, Ramses II is apparently yes, the one who built most of the monuments that you see. He's the one oh, who yeah. said, Hey, I'm gonna outdo every other pharaoh and re and just build everything. Yeah, yeah. What is it guy, I forget the one with the with the two gigantic statues of Ramses outside of it. But yeah, Ramses he uh he pretty much decided that was his thing. Oh, you're um, referring to the one built into the side of the uh, the wall. The yeah, mountain? yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's, I can't it's remember got, the name got, of it. It's it's two words for it. It's um, man. Up, oh, have fun with your meeting, Crowley. Yeah, four statues. Sorry, it's been a while in the Valley of the Kings. Yeah, I think so. Abu Simba. I was about to say that. Thanks, Mike. Because I, I used to be, um, I grew up being very into Egypt, but I have not been reading it in the Abu last Simba. few years. Thank yeah. you, Mike. Abu Simbel, that's 100% what it is. Yes. Um, no, a lot of people get it mixed up for Valley of the Kings, I think, but Abu Simbel is the one that Ramses II specifically uh, made. This is. We do know. a slightly lighter version of this color on you guys. Um, yeah. Yeah, we are talking uh, Tomb Temple. Yeah, well, it was kind of the, almost the same thing sometimes, right? But And of, often with these ancient civilizations, we really don't have a great idea of what, you know, tomb or temple even meant um well we we can read some thanks to the rosetta stone we can read um egyptian ancient egyptian but like we don't have the cultural cultural context it's easy to misinterpret things we don't have a live ancient egyptian to talk to sadly uh, so i'm just like accentuating the knuckles up here because it's fun um Oh yeah, with ancient history, ancient mysteries with Leonard Nimoy. Well, anything with Leonard Nimoy, come on. Wait, Leonard Nimoy narrates an ancient history show? Yes. Sign me up. <laughs> 
Ancient mysteries, apparently, is I, I had forgotten that. Rise, oh, Rise and Fall of the Third Reich. Thanks, Dragon and I. I mixed up those two books. The Rise of the Roman Empire, then. So look at that one. And there was there was another Roman Empire book. The strategy, the grand strategy of the Roman Empire. I think it might have been that I used to own. I'll have to look it up. But there are a couple of good books out there, you know, which may or may not be a bit dry. Or not, you know, depending. But I find that um, I like audiobooks on... Not, I like nonfiction audiobooks. I prefer them. I uh, actually really love my nonfiction audiobooks. Because I absorb the information in a different way. And then if I'm really interested in it, I'll pick it up and read it. And I'll get, like, even more out of it. So. Alright. We're just making some nice highlighted knuckles this on this guy. It's fun. It's a good time. Now, if we really want them to look knuckly, if you look at most people's hands, although my camera's not cooperating, but often we have a bit of a pink color because of blood flow over our knuckles. So we could do that here. Um, we have a couple of color choices that we could go with. We could go with our kobold scale a bit. Um, we could go with our eldritch purple mixed in also. I'd probably take this lighter one maybe and make a pinkish glaze. Um, the other one, the other uh, color you could use that's also Dungeon Dwellers is uh, Succubus Kiss. But as we haven't used that one yet, I think I would shy away from it. I think I'll try to mix a color with one drop of Cobalt Scale and one drop of Eldritch Purple and a little bit of that highlight skin color mixed into it. And then I'll put a lot of water in it and I'll decide... That's actually a pretty, pretty color. Here, I'll hold on. I'll show you guys. There, that's a pretty color. Kind of a muted rosy, warm rose. Elder's Purple and Succubus Kiss would take it very purple. I think I wanted a little more red. So the Cobalt Scale worked well in this. I mean, it mutes it out a little bit, but then the skin tone is also very muted, so it's not a bad thing. Hey there, Gaston Corgi. You have an awesome name. <laughs> I'm glad you've been excited. I'm a little slow today. I did not sleep great last night, but I am doing my best. Uh, Pacific Islands, that's an interesting historical specialty. Yeah, not a lot of those books on audio for sure, right, Mathophile? Yeah. Um, the Dresden Files books are famous for being amazingly narrated, Dark Angel, except for the one that they had to go back and re-record because the guy who does them is Spike from Buffy, whose name I never remember, and uh, apparently he is fantastic. Um, oh, there, I, I've read everyone in that series that way, like, audiobook-wise. Yeah. Um, and they're fantastic. In fact, it's been a hot minute since I listened to the most recent one, which I think was number 14 or 15, and I haven't even checked to see when the latest one has come out yet. Um, Jim Butcher's really good ever like he releases yeah, them James, periodically. James Marsters, I think you're right, yeah. Or James Marston. Marsters. That's, Marsters are yeah. Yeah, so yeah, he's uh, apparently I mean I am I'll tell you guys you can you can judge me if you like, but I'm not a Dresden Dresden Files fan. Um <gasps> tried to pick up the first book oh. and hated it, so I put it down and I never went on. There's Don't worry, so guys. much I'll flip the restream button now. Don't worry guys. Yeah, uh-huh, uh-huh. No, he, he lost me in the first book because, and I'll tell you why, because I did not like Harry. If I don't like yeah, the protagonist, yeah, if I don't like the protagonist in the series, there are so many books that I'm behind on reading. I'm just going to put the book down. Um, yeah, it, it's hard, like, especially when, for me, the, butch, the, the Dresden novels kind of were a filler in between other books I, were, I was reading. So it's uh -huh. really hard to read, like, Rothfuss. And then jump to Butcher, oh yeah I like Butcher oh well yeah enough. but God but Rothfuss like, is so those, those, no different yeah, those dudes are in such different leagues as far as writing but yeah I mean because I also read the I think it's the Caldera trilogy or yeah I don't what it is. yeah the, it, yeah. It, it, it's the Roman esque one that he wrote the, the trilogy I liked that, that I actually read all of those. I, I did too. Those I liked those first before I read the Dresden novels. And, yeah. And then, but the Dresden, I don't know. Harry was was 
he's definitely not as likable in the first book. And you can tell Jim definitely did some some huge changes with him over the course of like three or four books there. Yeah. But the problem is, is when people read the first one and don't like it, they're not likely to pick up the rest of it. Right, exactly. I mean, when I have somebody, when I have a friend flat out tell me, oh, you should just uh, Wikipedia the plots of the first couple books and then start reading. I'm like, okay, then I'm not going to give my, I'm, not, I'm sorry, but I'm not going to go there. Like, uh, you got to get me. You got to get me in the first book. If I don't like the protagonist, I'm I'm out. I mean, maybe eventually I'll come back and try to read one of them. I don't know, but but like I said, there's so many books in the world that I want to read. So, but and you know what? Dresden Files has more than enough rabid fans that they do not need me to read the book. This actually happened with the Firefly show too. I had a friend who was so fanatic about it, he totally turned me off on it. And uh then I was, you know, cursed by numerous people but for not liking it. And it's just like, dudes, you know, there are enough of you. I do not need to be yet another fan on the boat with Firefly. I can see that that is, that is an okay show, but it is not, like, my thing. So, so yeah, I, am, I go against the grain on a couple of those. The widely, wildly geek popular uh, things, I guess. Yeah, nobody's worrying about Jim Butcher. I mean, the guy's a multimillionaire easily, several times over for his books. So I don't think he's going to care if I don't read them. <laughs> Absolutely. He pumps books out at like a um, at a reasonable enough rate that sell well enough that like he's he's definitely not doing, he's not hurting. By no, means. no, he does. He's he's doing quite well. Um, when you kind of have to like with series fiction. If you're doing that, if you've got, a, especially if you've got a long arc, which he does, um, you know, you've got to put out books regularly. Your fan base, you know, wants them. It, otherwise, they get irritated at you. So. There we go. All right. So I had a little pinkish color to the knuckles and I promptly re-highlighted it and I lost a little bit of it. So I'm going to grab a little bit of this. I'm going to glaze it down. I, w I put it on a little too thick the first time. So I'm making colored water here. I want to get a little bit more rosiness across those knuckles and a little bit down here where these knuckles disappear and a little bit here and a little bit here. It just adds a little bit more complexity, a little bit more rosiness. Rawr. He's got a good looking hand now. I'm pretty happy with the hand. Let's see about face. Boop. Oh yeah, for sure. If you're just getting into graphic novels, there's so much. Yeah, it's it's there's so much. Speaking of Rafa's, is there a is this is his third book out yet? No, probably not because uh, Patrick Rothfuss, and I respect this actually as a writer, but uh, he talks about it in his first book. He's like, my dad always told me that if I'm if something is worth doing right, it's worth taking your time to get it right. And so he is not somebody who's going to rush that book out. Plus, if you think about it, if you wrote a book like Name of the Wind, like critically acclaimed, your first ever novel, and you get this huge following, and then you follow it up with Wise Man's Fear, I, how do you follow that act? Like, your third book had better be amazing. Like, if you're doing a trilogy, that third book had better be just flat out, you know, like, it's just, uh, <laughs> it's hard, right? I can imagine, like, the, the pressure to get it right. Uh I completely agree. I think that those books are, I, they, they, I read those books right around the same time I was reading a lot of others. I had just finished the entire wheel of time series. Oh, wow. Which was like reading basically uh, an encyclopedia. Yeah. Travelogue. <laughs> yes. I agree with you. I actually read the first eight um, wheel of time books because I was working at the game store with a guy who that was he, what he was into. So at least it gave us something to talk about during shifts when it was really boring in the evenings at the game store. Um, so, uh, and uh, yeah, but that, then I stopped after I, after I got a, I think that was I, the eighth book that came out. It had come out about the time. And then there was the next book wasn't out yet. So I just fell off of it. Yeah. That's there are plenty of people that uh, I, I think you could contribute Probably oh, 70% of that. In, yeah, thank you, Grosetti. You could contribute 70% of that novel, that entire series, to ladies sitting around drinking tea. Yeah, pretty much. Pretty much. Um, there's just so much plot that's pushed forward with that exact setting for some reason. Well, and then the then the travelogue, right? You know, Actually, I think that, I believe, don't quote me on this, but I think that that is actually read to a, led to a writer trope, that thing with the uh, Wheel of Time. Because now I, I know that in a recent uh, 
you know, how to write uh, type of thing that I saw uh, or read that tea drinking was particularly maligned as a as a form of moving the story forward. <laughs> because as it should be. Yes, the writer of the of the thing that I was reading uh, was like, uh, yeah, the minute you put down a cup of tea, you're asking your reader to just relax and go to sleep. So just stop. <laughs> So now I bet that's based on because of the the reaction to the Wheel of Time. So what yeah, I'm doing here, guys, is I'm as I'm making a circular highlight. It's very rounded, um, and I'm stippling a little bit too, just to get it um, not ultra smooth. Like this isn't metal or anything. His skin, it's it's got a little bit of texture to it. So I'm just kind of dabbing a little bit with my brush tip um, and making it a round highlight. So if I make the highlight round shaped, because this muscle is just so big and round. It helps to reinforce that that feeling of that shape. So it, it's much better than trying to do a flat highlight just like across. And if you did a highlight across this whole thing flat, I mean, technically the light probably is falling that way, but you could totally lose the feel of this shape. So when you're painting a rounded surface, use a rounded highlight. Also, uh, since we're talking about unpopular opinions, and maybe you share this one too. Um, I don't particularly care for any of Brandon Sanderson's stuff outside uh, of uh, the the King Killer Chronicle or the King not King Killer Chronicles. The is it is that what it's called? I don't remember. I uh, I've read some of Brandon's things. I liked. I really liked Steelheart. I thought Steelheart was good. Um, Warmlight Archive. I think that's what it's called. Okay. Did you try Steelheart? Yeah, I read. That's the superheroes, right? Yeah, yeah. Superheroes. That's the superhero. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it, it reminded me of like uh, more recently when I watched The Boys, for instance. Yeah, yeah, you know, uh huh. Basically. Yep. When I watched that series, that's kind of what it reminded me of. But then I was like, eh. Yeah. I don't know. I feel like Sanderson can set a good like uh, universe essentially, and then he can he can character build pretty well. I think, but I think he struggles. And like, I hated the way the Mistborn trilogy ended. Oh. Hated, hated it. Really, I and, I didn't. That was another one where I didn't like the characters, so I stopped after book one, Mistborn. Oh uh, yeah, that's. Let's see here. All right, so the yeah, go ahead. I think I just don't know how to end. That's the thing. Yeah, well, there's another. I mean, there are several very popular authors who don't really know how to do endings very well or don't have a feel for it. I mean, we're all different. I'm very slow at beginnings, but I think I'm pretty good at endings. So you know, it's like it's like different writers have different strengths thing. But uh, I'm not a huge, I mean, Brandon's, um, what he does well is magic systems. He always comes up with very creative ways uh, to look at magic. Um, and so I really uh, think he's very good at that. But but yeah, other than I liked Steelheart, I kind of liked, I liked the world. It, it came out before a lot of that dystopian uh, superhero thing was fashionable. So uh, I give him a little cred for kind of uh, being one of the first there. But I'm sure that comic books have been doing it all through the years, and I just haven't been reading enough comics to uh, know that it's been out there. But All right, so highlight on the top of the muscle, but rounded so that you can see it, see where the light is. And then I was going to talk about veins. Um, I said yesterday veins are boring. They are kind of boring. I mean, they are going to stand out from the surrounding. You can see, though, like especially where these are. Um, if I turn the arm, you can definitely see that the light is falling on where these veins stick out. So you do have to highlight them just like we've, uh, we've done here. Now, normally veins are not like more reddish or anything. Um, they just kind of pop out and there's enough skin over them to make them skin colored. Um, obviously where your skin is very thin, you've got, you know, a bluish, faint bluish color, but that's not the case usually on these big veins on the arms. Um, Mystery Men was the bestest. Um, but, uh, boom. Sorry, I'm just catching up on chat, making sure I didn't miss anybody here. But, uh, and I lost my thing. So, uh, so you want to highlight it according to skin. These are actually a little bit on the underside of the arm. So some of this stuff I'm just going to leave, like I left it normal skin color down here. And I, technically I probably shouldn't even do that. Probably I should shade it even more. Um, but I do want to pick the details out. What I'll probably do is just add a little bit of shading to that really bottom one. This really one down here is really on the underside of the arm. You, you wouldn't necessarily see much of it at all. So you can kind of paint over it and just leave a little bit of a suggestion. I maybe painted over it a little bit too much, but just to, so it's a darker, cause see now you can barely see it down here, this one. 
Yeah. So, because your, your arm's in shadow. So up here is where you're going to get the most highlights on these veins. And I don't like to just paint them in lines. I'm dabbing highlights. I, I did paint the first highlight probably all this color. But then I just uh, picked out some of the thicker or parts where they're kind of catching the light or, or moving. Picked out some of the details in this lighter color. So, so that it's kind of irregular because veins are kind of. Um, so I don't want them to just be, you don't want veins to just be lines. Uh, a lot of people paint them like that. You can get around that and not make them lines by doing maybe your first highlight along a lot of it, but then maybe dabbing just like I pretty much picked points where the vein was thicker or where it was horizontal to the light. And I did that a little extra highlight. Um, and the other thing is that you might want to, if it's really on the upside surface, you can blend in kind of like a, uh, kind of like a fold. You could, you could blend in the skin a little bit going into the top of the vein. If this vein was up higher. So like this guy up here, we could totally take our midtone and say, blend this color into the top of that vein. Because it's on the upside of the arm, it's going to catch some light. Don't want to lose my uh, shadow or my texture here. The reason there's a shadow back here is that we've got this big, huge shoulder pauldron coming down, so it's gonna cut off the light to there at least a bit. So that's why there's a shadow up here. Um, just kind of keeping. You don't have to be perfectly realistic with that, but you do have to keep it in mind. <sighs> Let's see here. Do, 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 do. All right, now I'm going to bring up this just a little bit more. I'm just going to dab at it. A little bit of highlights. And also, where the sculpt ends, if you want the vein to trail off more realistically, feel free to freehand it. Like, just take a little bit of paint and add, add a little bit to the end of that vein there. And that helps make it not just end like so this vein fades in pretty well, but this vein just ends. And so sometimes that's just an artifact from the molding process and giving it a little bit of extra help is not a bad thing. So if you add, see, then you can kind of blend that out into your uh, highlight here. So yeah, veins, veins, make that one a little thicker and lighter. So that is how I tend to do veins, at least in a dark skin tone, that's how I do veins. These might even be just a little bit too dramatic and I'll probably take a look at it later on to see if I think I need to knock these down, but they really are presented as very thick. So, I mean, they would really catch the light like that. Let me see here. Let me readjust here. Alrighty. This is coming along pretty well. So let's do the face. I'm going to not do the brow ridge because I'm pretty sure these are just eyebrows and that means they're going to be the same orange at, even though I painted them skin color. Um, they're going to be the same orange as the beard. So here we don't have a lot of details because there's a helmet. So we want to catch the top of the cheekbone and we want to catch his little nostrils because those are actually sculpted as coming out behind the nose guard here. And you want your highlight to go all the way up to here. So you want this, you want this cheekbone and like this, this tendon that goes all the way up to the top of the nose. You want to catch that for sure, quite strongly. One of the big faults that I often do with eyes is not bringing up the highlight far enough. Uh, you would not highlight like things like the underside of the eye that would stay dark because is uh, well, not only does he have a pretty heavy brow, but he's also got this helmet, which is going to make his eyes be somewhat in shadow. Work getting in the way of Anne, a man. I feel like Anne gets in the way of work, <laughs> ah, but welcome dog father. It's good to see you. Alrighty. So we're talking about highlighting faces. Also keep in mind, this is a surface control area, which is 
if you want the face to stay relatively dark, you've got to keep a lot of the face dark. And there's not much face area to work with. So you really have to be conscious of it on small areas. So like here, I was able to bring up a nice highlight here while keeping most of the arm dark. So it still conveys the dark skin tones, right? And this is true of any dark skin tone you do. Any African uh, skin tones, uh, Arabic skin tones, any, any dark skin tone that you're working with. Uh, you can bring your highlights up, but do keep a lot of the surface area that the as mu as dark as you want it to look. So here on this side, I've gotten a little bit too much highlight going on, um, and my face is starting to look lighter. So I need to go back with my base skin tone and lose a little bit of this highlight. Maybe reaccentuate a shadow in here. Um, maybe even grab a little bit of blue liner and make sure that I've got a shadow around the nostril there to bring out the detail of the nose. I want to make sure that I'm getting close enough. I wonder if I can get even closer. Let's see, maybe I can. Let me focus. Can you focus camera? Yeah, this is a good camera. This is how good this camera is, guys. Up close and personal. All right, so you can see his little nostril there. I want to accentuate that by putting a little bit of blue liner around it. See it? Same on the other side. I, if I decide it's too stark, I can always go back. But since it's a dark skin tone, you really want those little details to stand out. Yeah, this is all layering. Uh, well, actually, it's it's um, it's been shading too, uh, Corgi. So essentially, yesterday, today has all been highlighting. But yesterday, I blocked in. This is actually the base um, where I used this brown color, and then I used a bunch of blue liner. And I blocked in the shadows under here and around the muscles, you can see, and kind of set up everything to come back in and highlight today to get it to the point that I wanted it. So then today we went from this to this. Uh, and now we're doing the face and I'll work on this arm. So yeah, this camera is amazing. It is wonderful. We love the camera. Sweet. But yeah, I decided not to uh, not to do a lot of wet blending today. I decided to go back to my old style and do a lot of layering, which is, you know, using the well palette instead of the wet palette because I like to have uh, control over my paint consistency if I'm going to layer. Let me get this guy back. There we go. All right, so let's go. And we want to take our highlight color and kind of hit the top of that nostril to make sure that it comes out. You can see how fine my brush is. And this is where having a good brush really levels you up in miniature painting. If you are a new painter and you have not invested in an expensive Kalinske Sable, um, make sure you take care of your brushes first. Don't be in the habit of uh, like putting, leaving your brushes in the paint water or anything. But when you have gotten a fair bit of brush control and you take good care of your brushes, invest in an expensive brush. I mean, a good Kalinske Sable, this is a Raphael. I usually use Da Vinci. Um, it'll always have Kalinske on the barrel. And uh, what that is, is the highest grade of Red Sable. So the Kalinske is grade one and grade two. And I think they're either 10 or 15 grades of Sable. Uh, so you want to do this, like, because no other brush on earth is going to give you this tip. I mean, look at this. It's ridiculous. Like, seriously, who makes a brush like this? But this, this tip, the fineness of this tip, and in, in conjunction with thinning your paint a bit so that it is not super thick, you can see that this is kind of watery right? It's not very thick. If I draw a, a line with it, it's pretty transparent. Let's see if I can get it to show up. This is a light color. Here, let me use a darker color. These other guys are kind of watery too. But essentially, when you've got a brush with a tip like this and you thin your paint just a little, you can draw like really fine, even this is hard to see, but really fine little lines with it. And this is what enables you to do a lot of the super, super fancy stuff. There we go. See how fine those lines are? Like I can draw super fine lines. I can hit super fine details because of my brush and my thinned paint. So if you are new, the, the, uh, having a good brush, as long as you are a good brush keeper, um, instantly levels you up one or two levels. Because it takes the frustration out of trying to hit those details and not being able to because your brush is just not keeping a good tip. So I uh, recommend brands like Windsor & Newton Series 7. 
Um, Raphael, this this uh, particular 8408, I've become extremely fond of. It's uh, broken. It now that it's broken in, it's like as good as my Da Vinci. I was having a little bit of trouble with Raphael's up to this point. Just the loading of them. They're such big, wide brushes in the belly compared to what I usually use, which is much thinner. My usual brush that I go to for everything is the Da Vinci Maestro Series 10, size 1. Again, you see the Kalinsky there. So if you compare these two, you can see how much larger the brush I'm using in today is compared to my usual brush. And part of that is that this is a very large model. Um, so in general, I wanted a brush that could do a little bit more and that wouldn't always be painting tiny areas with. Oh, it is worth the cost. I mean, this brush is easily uh, a few years old, right? And it still keeps a perfect point. In fact, it's only getting better over time um, because I'm taking care of it. So, you know, you might spend 15 to $20 on one of these brushes, but then, and you'd be like, oh my gosh, but I don't usually only spend like two brushes, $2 on my brush or $5, right? But that $2 or $5 brush is going to be dead in a month or, you know, hooked severely at the tip or whatever else, you know, going poof. Whereas your really expensive brush is going to keep going for years. So it is absolutely worth it. And you will be, once you have utilized it, and remember to thin your paint with them, the thinner the tip, the thinner the paint you should be using. And also remember to unload your brush. Don't just pick up a bunch of paint and then use it. You want to dab it off so that it comes to a very, very good point, like a razor sharp point. Then you know you've got control. Because the name of the game when you're painting tiny details, like eyeballs and nostrils, and even just putting like little highlights on things, the name of the game is control. And when you can see it and you can paint it, then your frustration level with this hobby goes way down and you can start to really enjoy yourself and you can get better effects than you ever dreamed you could. Just being able to hit everything is so useful. Now there's a little tendon that goes down on the side of the mouth. I can kind of see it on this side. This side, there's kind of like beard, beard sculpted over it. And it's also like room for shadows down there. So I don't know that I'm going to do that tendon. I've got the highlights going up nice under his eyes. This will help uh, with, with dark skin tones, making sure you put a decent highlight up near the, up on, on the cheekbones where the light will catch uh, up here is really useful because dark skin tones are hard to draw attention to sometimes because their dark things tend to recede from our eye. So in order to really pull the attention up to the face on a dark skinned model, it helps if you put some serious highlights up like near the eyes and around the mouth so that you can convey expression. Um, still keep the skin tone dark enough that it, that it looks dark. So I'm going to make sure that I've got, you know, a nice dark brown for at least half of this area. Even if, it, it, if, even if it means coming in and tuning it just a little bit. But you want at least half of the area. For it to look like dark skin, half of the area has got to be dark. So that's that's looking pretty good. Pretty good. You notice, though, that since I've gotten so light and since my highlights are taking up more room than they are here on the arm, his face does look like it's a lighter color than the arm does. So one way to deal with that would be to glaze. So to take my base skin tone... Put it down on the palette, add some water to it. I'm not even going to make a whole well of this because really I just want it for one small area. There we go. So really watery, really thin. What I'm building here is just a spot glaze. So it's just one brush full of glaze. Easy to do on a wet palette, although sometimes your water can, your water control can be a little harder on a wet palette. And I'll just paint it right over those areas. I'll still retain some highlight, but what this will do is darken down the area so that it looks more in line with this. And there we go. Sometimes it takes a bit of tuning. Like often, because colors are all relative um, and they'll look lighter or darker depending on what is next to them, uh, you, some, you often will have to tune your colors after you uh, put them down. You're going to find that putting a dark or a light color next to them is going to change how they look and then you have to adjust it. Maybe you need to highlight a little bit. Maybe you need to glaze to knock it down to get it where you want it. Um, it's actually, uh, I don't know if they are bones set for, they're the dungeon dwellers. So maybe my, maybe my, uh, Mick. So I, I call them just dungeon dwellers because they come in the boxes. I suppose you could order them dungeon dwellers. Um, 
you could order them as part of the bone set that contains them. Um, but yeah, they are bones colors. I decided I wanted to uh, showcase these. I'm just going to line around the teeth here. Kind of pick them out a little bit. I'll come back in with an off-white for them. Make sure I've got the mouth nice and dark. Now I'm going to take my reddish color and do that lower lip because that's definitely somewhere that it would be reddish. Uh, doo -doo. Yeah, oh, it's... Uh, I almost never buy them in person in Dragon Sin. Um, or Dragon's Inn. Uh, I actually order them from uh, Dick Blick usually. I, I can buy them if, like at ReaperCon, Tori, Hangar 18, which they aren't doing anymore, sadly. They always used to sell them in person, so I would I would totally, uh, you know, make sure to support his store. But now I just order them online. Um, DickBlick.com has uh, a great guarantee. So if you get a brush and it's compromised, if it's gotten scrunched in the mail or whatever, um, you can essentially put in, they'll send you a replacement. Uh, so... Buying brushes online is not as uh, fraught with peril as you may, as you may worry. Okay. Oh, is it? Uh, for what though? Diesel. All of them. Da Vinci Maestro, Raphael, Windsor Newton, all of it. Because we did have a Kalinsky shortage a while ago. Because there was some drama. with imports. I'm going to add some, just using this dark rose color that I mixed to uh, kind of pinkify, not, not seriously pinkify. Somebody actually asked this recently for my Patreon and I may do a little feature on it about makeup, how to make makeup look natural. Um, this guy obviously is not wearing makeup, but I've, I've using pink to accentuate his muscle or his, uh, his knuckles and stuff. So probably things like his lip are also going to be a little bit pinkish. I could also go blue. Some people go blue black with uh, fire giant lips, but the key here is that you want a little bit of your skin tone mixed in to the pinkish color to make it look natural and not garish. Uh, da Vinci's. Oh, Windsor and Newton all out. Try Amazon for Windsor and Newton Series 7. Amazon does have Windsor and Newton Series 7. They also have an excellent guarantee. I actually know somebody who orders his uh, Series 7s from Amazon. And uh, one of his brushes arrived squished and they uh, replaced it. No questions asked. Alrighty, so just taking a little bit of this light pink and doing a couple of highlights like right near the middle of the lip to bring it out. And again, we're, this isn't garishly pink, right? It's, uh, it's just a little pink. So it doesn't really uh, impinge on, doesn't make him look like he's got garish makeup on or anything. Just makes it look more natural. And since there's a little bit of a tongue back here, I may add some of this dark pink color into the mouth, just in the back. It probably won't be seen very well, but it, it'll, again, kind of help carry the illusion should anybody look that there is pink inside the mouth. Um, I would not go as dark with Frost Giant Skin Twistedoma unless I was going for a dramatic lighting effect like on my troll that I did recently. Uh, Fire Giants are, are usually depicted as dark skin, like they're charred. Uh, whereas frost giants, uh, I usually see more of a lighter blue and I would, I would usually go blue gray. Um, but, uh, but I mean, I, I, as far as how I highlight, as far as like the shapes of the highlighting and the, and the areas, yeah, I just wouldn't go quite so dark. Especially with a uh, frost giant, if it's out, they're out in the snow, there's a lot of reflected light. Let me grab a, let's see, how would I mix a tooth color? Probably a little bit of ogre skin, goblin skin, and uh, actually probably a little bit of a little bit of my base skin tone mixed with a little bit of uh, ogre skin and white. Let's do that. I just want to block in his teeth a little bit. I mean, how dark you want to do your skin tones for your various fantasy monsters is completely up to you. 
I just really actually enjoy painting dark skin tones. So for me, a uh, fire drain is an opportunity to go real dark. Um, I just, I don't like uh, frost giants to be as dark, probably because frost is so pale. So thematically, it seems odd to me to go that direction. So I mix a little bit of ogre skin with a little bit of my main skin tone and a bit of pure white. And that has given me this creamy color, which is perfect for teeth. I would never go pure white, especially with teeth on a dark skin tone. It looks really, I mean, frost giant skin tones are a whole different stream, right? Twisted Oma. I mean, of course you're going to shade and highlight everything just like you do here. It's the only difference is how dark or how light do you go and what colors do you choose? And frost giants, everybody seems to have very different um, opinions on how dark or light they should be. Everybody seems to have strong preferences. So essentially, if you go pure white with the teeth on this guy, they're going to stick out like a sore thumb. Uh, but if you use an off-white that's got a bit of brown in it and a bit of yellow and a bit of white, they're still light enough for them to show up and be teeth, but they are not like garish and cartoony. Uh, it's very easy if you use pure white to get very garish cartoony teeth. So teeth, teeth. Yes, it got like a sore tooth, right? Um, and I probably also will use this color as an eyeball color, maybe. Well, oh, that's right. We were going to do glowy eyes, maybe. Hmm. I don't know. I don't know. I haven't, I haven't fully committed to that yet. I'm still debating a lot of this stuff. This, this is an example of how I tend to build a model as I go sometimes where if I don't have a really strong opinion on, uh, what color I want things to be or what effects I want to do, I just kind of like take it as I go. But I am going to paint the eyes in at least off-white. If I'm going to do them glowing, I want to underpaint them in pure white. But for now, we're going to go off-white. We can always come back in. And this is a chance to reshape the eye. This eye is very large. It's kind of blocky. Um, and here, if you wanted the eye to be maybe a little bit more narrow, this is the chance you can, you can do that by painting it in a different, a slightly different shape and a little bit smaller. And if you leave a little bit of shadow, you want to leave a little bit of the shadow color around it so that it stands out better. And so even with an off white, as you can see against the darkness of the skin, you still, it looks like a pure white, right? It looks really bright. So here again, we're to the point where if, uh, if the paint isn't coming off of my brush, that means there's not enough water in it. No, Rathmore, I really don't want to, um, I'm trying to trying to paint this guy like decently, not, uh, just do him like kind of half hours like I normally do. Uh, where I just paint him up to a point and uh, then just kind of toss him in a box. Uh, I'd rather use this guy for a lot of different uh, tutorials. And so I don't want to do anything to it that's going to impinge on my enjoyment of the model or make me feel like it's just a just a practice mini. Um, so I don't want to paint one eye glowing one eye not. Also pay attention to the fact that, that the cheekbones, he's roaring. So his cheekbones are definitely scrunching up. And so his eyes are definitely squinty. So I'm making the one very narrow. Both of them are pretty narrow. But if you want him to look angry and wrathful, give him more narrow eyes. There we go. That one got a little bit, a little bit too big. Yeah, nothing, uh, nothing makes me lose enthusiasm for a model faster than just doing something like kind of halfway on it that I didn't originally want to do. Then I just totally lose enthusiasm. All right, so there's a little bit more squinty. Still big. His eyes are pretty widely spaced. We'll figure out what we're going to do later. After, after doing that highlight on the cheekbone, I'm like, well, glowing effect, I don't know, maybe... The other thing about a glowing effect on these eyes would be that we would have to bring up an area that's normally 
in shadow, which is the brow under the brow there. Um, and we'd have to make it light. And it can be very hard to do a lighting effect when you've got a deeply recessed area because the natural shadow falling on that area will automatically fight against your glow effect. It's much easier to do a glow effect on a flat area like the runes of this sword where it's not deeply recessed. Um, then you're not fighting against a natural shadow that falls on it. But in this, in these eyes, when you tilt him away from the light and have the light falling, you can definitely see a really dark shadow right above those eyes. And that's going to make it difficult to do glowing eyes on this guy. Hey, Glenn, thanks for the resub. So that would be another reason not to do glowing eyes on this guy. Usually I do do glowing eyes on, on fire giants because that's often how they are depicted, but I don't know. I'm going to debate it. I'm going to think about it. I'm also going to add a little bit of water to my skin tones since it's been uh, a while. They are starting to dry out a little bit. And I don't want to lose them. So when I say a little water, usually I just kind of dip my brush in the water and just add like till it's, you know, there's that much water in the brush. And then I just add that to my well o paint. It's just a little bit of water, but only a little bit of evaporation will have happened. You don't want to add too much water because then you're going to like just kind of wreck the paint and you're going to have to wait for it to get thicker or add more paint to it to make it a thicker, uh, thicker paint. Yeah, Chewy, you know, we're just hanging out. You missed some, uh, some history discussion and some comic book discussion and some other reading topics discussion, you know, like you do. And, and, you know, you missed me painting muscles and, uh, and, and knuckles and things, but, uh, we're still painting. We're still here. This vein is very odd because it just comes out a little and it looks like it might be there and there. So I may have to actually, um, kind of paint plastic surgery that vein and kind of decide how it really should look and kind of freehand it in. I'm going to make it a little bit jiggly. If so, I'm going to make it a little jagged. So let me see. Let me get a little bit more paint here. May have thinned this color too much to utilize it this way. Let me go and grab, grab a little bit extra. So there, I'm just kind of freehanding the rest of it in. Because I only, I see a little bit of a raised area here, and I see a little bit of a raised area here. Um, and then I actually see a little bit up here. But these are not sculpted as clearly as these are. Except for this one down under the arm, right there. So we're going to grab some of our first highlight color here for our skin. And remember what I did to mix this color is I used our base skin tone from yesterday and then I added in an extra, I took a brush full of that and added in an extra drop of goblin skin, the orange color, and an extra drop of pure white to make it lighter and warmer. Now I'm just going to come up here on top of the arm, kind of block in some highlights because up here, they're, unlike here where we've got an overhang, there really isn't an overhang here. The, the armor plate comes right down because he's raising his arm. So we can go straight for the highlight. We don't have to uh, keep a shadow in play except right up next to this. Mm-hmm. Well, good. Da Vinci is still out there. That just that should just make a bunch of people run out and buy Da Vinci instead of Winsor Newton and then totally convert you guys to liking Da Vinci. Remember, series 10, size 0 or size 1. Size 2 is quite large. Would not recommend. Unless you are painting a lot of big things. But even then, with a large brush... And it depends on your painting style too. If you're using a lot of thicker paint, then yeah, the Da Vinci or the um, yeah the Da Vinci size two, series ten, maybe your your baby. Um, but if you're using a thinner paint at all and you want a bigger brush, I would recommend the Raphael size one, eighty four oh eight, the one that I'm using right here because it still has a great a great tip on it. 
very fine tip. Good, you can play with it then, Stephanie. I mean, always try different brands of brushes. I know they're expensive, so, you know, you, sometimes you have to budget. But, and give it a chance, too, because some of these brushes, I feel like I've had to kind of break them in a little bit. I mean, David and I argue about this a little because he, he doesn't think that brushes have a break-in period, but I think they do. Like, this Raphael, when I first used it, I was like, Meh. but now it's, like, my favorite brush after I've uh, brutalized it a little bit. <laughs> So I don't know. Maybe brushes have a breaking in period and maybe they don't. I, I, su I suspect your mileage may vary and it depends on the shape of uh, the brush that you like. Yeah, well, the Da Vinci is a little bit more thin, remember? So uh, it's good for thinned paint application and it's good, very, very good for fine detail and textures, in my opinion. I'm just kind of trying to bring up all of this while still uh, bringing out our uh, our little veins here. Don't want to leave too much of a shadow though, because this is the upper part of the arm. So our veins might need to be a little more subtle up here on the top. Um, I need a little more orange in there. I thinned down my uh, highlight, skin tone highlight a little too much. So that means if it gets a little too thin where it's really not showing up, then you need to add, you kind of need to remix it, add a little bit more paint and not water so that you get your highlight color back enough, thick enough for it to actually draw a line. Uh, yeah, I use, I use an X-Acto for, for my mold lines. Like I use the, the brand that Reaper always used for mold cutting, um, which has the, the kind of scalpel blade. Uh, it's just what I like. Um, and it's, you know, it's still a pain to take the mold lines off, but here at least I can kind of scrape and slice them off. Depends on if it's bones or bones black, what your best uh, type of technique is, but with a nice sharp blade, it is possible to just kind of slice off and uh, wear down the area around here. Files don't work well on bones, so too gooey. But yeah. Often though with bones, um, if I feel like I can't really get at some of the places, I'm more likely to take some green stuff and actually re-sculpt the area, do do a fill, do a skin of green over the area to hide the mold line. Because I feel like I get a better result that way than when I'm just trying to scrape away at an X-Acto knife. And like this area here could be problematic, for example. There's a mold line that cuts right across here. There it is, see it? That's gonna be really problematic to try to take off with a knife maybe. Um, there's some detail and uh, texture here. And so I may just take some green and do a bit of fill. Bones and Bones Black. Bones Black is far more like a standard styrene plastic. It's um, the durometer is higher, so it's not as bendy uh, mathophile. So, you know, this traditional Bones is quite bendy, but Bones Black is more like a harder plastic. There we go. Let's just get some of uh, this highlighting on here. I like Bones Black a lot. I really, really think it's a good product. Um, this guy just came in regular Bones, so I just grabbed him. The bigger models, I think, are just fine in regular Bones. Like, because they're so thick, usually, that having them be in a softer material really doesn't affect it at all. And helps keep, keep, keep things nice and inexpensive when you're dealing with really big minis. We are very spoiled these days for how we can get these nice big models so cheap. Let's see. Yeah, you can also use the sanding sticks, that's true. 
Yes, that's true. You'd also, you aren't going to see uh, a big bones mini just shatter into pieces on the floor, which is nice. I'm going to take out. Oh, that's way too light. Tried a little bit of a lighter highlight and went, oh, no, no, too much, too much. But I do want to bring out this uh, vein a little bit more. And again, I'm kind of dabbing. Like, I want to kind of make it a little heavier in places and a little lighter in others. I want to accentuate areas that the light might catch. Um, so I want to just make sure those veins are still up there. But I also want to make sure that there are there's a highlight on top of this arm too around the vein. So little do we know we'd be talking a lot about veins today. Somebody asked about painting veins anyway, so. And I said it was boring and then I spent almost a whole show on it, so obviously uh, it wasn't as boring as I thought. Kind of using the uh, kind of an intermediate intermediate highlight to kind of blend this in a bit, lose some of my texture. Sometimes if your paint's a little thick and you try to go in and do kind of a stippling texture for highlighting, you can get um, it just looks a bit blocky or smudgy. So you have to kind of take one of your darker skin colors and maybe glaze or maybe stipple a little bit over it. Remember, you don't want to totally lose your dark color, but you do want to highlight. So. Sometimes you have to muck around, go back and forth, and uh, try to make it all blend together. This is where I might do a spot wet blend if I really want to blend something in a little better or lose a little texture, but not everything. There we go. That's more like it. So then we had to pick up this round, this muscle piece. Haha, <laughs> cute Rathmore. Oh yeah, yeah, old stuff, old stuff, uh, Beery Goblin. Yeah, I've had that happen. Like I, I own some of those old metal dragons and they're just so fragile. Especially because back in those days it was high lead content and high lead makes everything softer. So then when it really hits with a lot of impact, it really does flatten bits and that's just irreparable. You have to re-sculpt it at that point and uh, Usually you're too heartbroken to even try. <laughs> this is coming up nicely. I think this is a really nice brown skin tone, actually. I like it a lot. I might have to make a note of this one. And yeah, I know it's a custom mix of all sorts of weird stuff, but uh, I, I'm actually getting quite fond of it. I think I might use it on my next African character model that, that I paint. Dark skin tones are really a lot of fun to paint. I mean, I know a lot in the, in the past, I, a lot of people have found them frustrating because you do usually have to mix them. Um, there are some exceptions. Obviously, I created um, ebony flesh and ruddy flesh uh, to give you guys a good foundation on dark skin tones. And those are totally doable uh, and work well. But this gives us, this is a little bit of a warmer African skin tone. I am liking it quite a bit. So do not, do not be scared of dark skin tones. They are really fun once you get the hang of them. They have such beautiful color variation. I'm afraid that the problem with being a paint line designer is that you stare at people in public trying to figure out what color their skin is. It's like, how would I mix that? There are moments. Actually, yesterday I saw a guy when I was out walking Kiri in the park, um, who had beautiful, really beautiful dark skin, really dark, uh, not quite blue black, but that really, really dark skin. And I was trying to figure out what, what color the highlight would be. <laughs> it's just terrible. Miniature painters are terrible people. I guess artists all over, right? Cause you know, canvas painters do the same thing, trying to figure out how to depict a color. It's arms day. Well, no, it's actually been face day and arms day. As you can see, I'm really liking how this one is turning out. See how, see how when you make like the shape of the highlight guys, when you, when you make the shape of the highlight mimic the surface, how it really looks like you really bring out those masses, like the volume of those masses. He looks really muscly because we went with such a nice rounded highlight 
um, and I'm using the shape, I'm fitting the shape of the highlight to the shape of the mask. So like for this, this is kind of a bucket shape. And so I have a bucket shaped highlight, you know, and that, that helps bring everything out. Um, we also did a hand. We also did this hand. We haven't done this hand yet. I'm almost there. Yeah, I, I like to kind of do it myself. The databases are nice. Um, with skin tones, though, I find that you really have to kind of, like, question them. Um, like, like, okay, what material is he using? Like, is he using acrylic? Was he doing this on the computer? Um, you know, because that's going to be a little bit different, uh, you know, when you're, what you're, how you're trying to interpret the, the, like, skin tone. Like, a lot of people will look at makeup swatches, but even those are made to go over the top of an underlying skin tone. So you kind of have to think about stuff like that when you're using a skin tone database. I find it just much more effective to try to look at people in person and see what they actually look like. Um, and, and maybe look at photos until I find a skin tone that I'd maybe like to try to duplicate. Um, but yeah. Okay. Who is looking, who is talking about Dunsons and Doggos? Uh, Bearded Goblin, um, you mean the one that I'm talking about, right? The one that I'm using here is, uh, is crazy difficult. Probably it's not, it's just, uh, I've just randomly mixed together a bunch of stuff. So my base skin tone here, and actually if you wanted just something out of a bottle, you probably could just go for Mwangi Brown, um, which is the African skin tone in the Pathfinder paint line. Um, but I mean, I used, I created this from, from just random paint. So what I did earlier is... Boy, we zoomed out. We zoomed in a lot today, guys. So what I did earlier is I mixed, uh, I wanted a dark color. So I started with Dungeon Gray, six drops. And then I dropped three drops of Goblin Skin in it because I wanted it to go brown. It's a lot of black in here and a lot of orange in here. Orange and black make brownish colors. So I went that way. Then I did two drops of red because the, actually the orange was a bit yellowy and it needed more warmth. And then I actually wanted to cool off from there and add more complexity. So I did two drops of Eldritch, Eldritch Purple. And that makes this beautiful color right here. Um, which you would never think, but which now is one of my favorite new skin tones that I'm going to be using all the time. <laughs> so the bottom line is guys, experiment, right? Experiment. Uh, do, 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 do. Let's see here. Yeah. Finding miniatures of dogs that are not the Dungeons and Doggos D and D dogs is, um, is hard. Uh, I don't, I'm always looking. I keep telling Ron that we need to do, a, 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 like we do a familiar pack, but we need to do different breeds of dogs. Like a doggy pack. And then we'd have to do a kitty pack, probably. Different kitties. Although the crazy cat lady has, you know, a lot of different kitties. So she, maybe she's already uh, provided for that need. But, um, yeah. So, all right. So we got some dramatic lighting. There we are. All right, so pretty good, actually. I mean, I could go in with, um, at least with my base color and highlight just a little bit. I mean, there would be some under reflection. I need to thin this just a bit more, a little bit more water. There would be a little bit of under reflected light probably wherever he is. So putting your base coat back in as a, a little bit of a highlight in the uh, underside area can be good. I might want to kind of tone it down with a little bit of mixing a little bit of blue liner into it, which is how I did the shadow in the first place, but leave maybe just a little bit more warmth to bring out the muscle. You never want to look at the underside of your miniature and have it look like you did nothing, but you also don't want to highlight down there because there wouldn't be one. So I want to put something down there just a little bit, just a little bit. a little bit of under reflection but I'm not going to get too fancy with it yeah right Glenn yeah we've been asking for one for ages and then the problem I think is just getting a sculptor interested in it because four-legged um, models are generally difficult more difficult than two-legged models for a lot of sculptors um, Jason Weeby is the exception 
Jason likes animals and is very good at them. But I don't know. It could just be that there's other things that are more important to get sculpted right now that often take priority over, you know, other little things we might think about wanting. We do have a, you know, we, we have a few, I think we still have a pug somewhere, but yeah, for those of us who want like sheep dogs or something. Now I will tell you that I did paint up one of the warlord war dogs, the Templar war dogs, um, as a border collie and it worked pretty well. So you could probably paint one up as a Sheltie. They're a little big, but you could do it because there's one that's kind of got flopped over ears, I think. Uh, do, 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 do. Hey, Strange. I'm back on Fire Giant. I'm, uh, as you can see, I've highlighted his skin tones. Um, we actually, now the only thing we have left to highlight on the upper part of him is the other hand. And actually, I guess I've got some legs. I should probably do some legs. Uh, yeah. Yeah, Andy does uh, good animals also. He's put a lot of effort into getting better at animals. Andy has a tailspinner. I want to put a little bit of highlighting on these legs. This is difficult just because it's hard to tell what this is. It's like a big broad surface that had armor sculpted over it. You can kind of see that maybe this is meant to be a muscle mass, but you can't really tell. So you kind of just have to fudge it. Um, just kind of try to figure out what you might be looking at. Highlight it accordingly. Probably nobody's going to call you on it. Get a little bit of highlight in there. A little bit of highlight down here because this might be his knee. Don't want to lose your shadows though. Don't want to lose your mid-tone. Still want this to look like dark skin. So remember to keep a bunch of the area dark. Maybe introduce a little bit of shadow down here. Remember, blue liner is our shadow. Might want a little bit of a shadow up here. Other leg is uh, a little bit easier, but it's also really dark in shadow. So there's not going to be a lot of highlight because it's um, being overhung by this area. So as you can see, it's very dark. You can hardly see anything. So I'm going to bring in my blue liner pretty hard to um, emphasize that shadow. Oh yeah, that's true. Dark Sword is doing a lot of dog minis, isn't? Aren't they? They're doing a lot of anthropomorph anthropomorphic animals. But Jim was talking about getting uh, some normal scale dogs done because he already has a few. Like he has their their schnauzers, um, for example, and stuff. And he actually did put out our Shiloh Shepherd Leo. Actually, now that I think about it, I'd forgotten about that briefly. But Jim at Dark Sword likes to um, get the. Uh, the animal friends of his friends sculpted. So Leo, our Shiloh, who died last year, passed away last year, Kiri's best bud, um, is immortalized twice in the Dark Sword line. He actually is a kind of a Templar paladin type, um, kind of almost Arabic looking, uh, anthropomorphic. And then Leo is also a Shiloh shepherd mini. So if you want a big, happy, wolfy looking dog mini to uh, accompany your ranger or your whatever character, um, there is a Leo available from Dark Sword. He's big too because Leo was big. He's a hundred pound shepherd. Just blocking in more shadows around this area. All right. I want to bring a little bit more. I don't know. There's not, you wouldn't put much highlight here. It's just so overshadowed by so many other things, but you do want to pay attention to it a little bit. So We'll just highlight it a bit. Understand that it's probably still going to disappear because of all this shading. And go to deal with this area. Oh, that's a bummer, Coops. Yeah, I know. When that happens for Kiri, I'm just going to be a wreck. Uh, well, Palette, Cheap Joe's Art Supplies, Bearded Goblin. Um, there you go. Uh, Zero down there just uh, linked it. And it was on sale for only five bucks as of last week. So if that sale is still going on, I would say get one. Five bucks is so inexpensive. And the small wells are so useful for miniature painting. Uh-oh. 
I'm keeping an eye on my doglet out of the corner of my eye. And we may have, we may have to tie up the stream soon. I guess it is already after 11. We started just a tad late, so I like to go a little later when, uh, when that happens, just to make sure we have enough time to cover stuff. Oh no, is he showing his butt? I guess that is a giant butt cheek. Little did we know we were going to be painting fire giant butt cheek. This has got to be a weeby sculpt. Let's see, a little bit of shadow up here. A bit of shadow down there. I want to make sure this is nice and dark. Shadow here. Side cheek, yes. Side butt, yep. Yeah, that's a Kiri too. She's uh she's very uh, young looking dog for her age. People don't believe she's twelve and a half. Somebody asked me the other day if she was a puppy, and I was like, oh uh, no. Rather the opposite. But she definitely, I mean, she has a lot of accidents saying that's really how Kiri is showing her age. And she's on uh, anti-inflammatory meds for just a touch of arthritis. Her hips are good, but uh, you still get a little bit of stiffness and soreness when you get old. So again, round highlights to show roundness of an area. I'm going to pummel this into you guys. Pummel, pummel, pummel. Yeah, I mean, you paint what you paint. There are just some sculptors, Mathophile, who are uh, who are famous for for definitely sculpting the naughty bits in. Um, so usually on animals is when Jason Jason hates uh, animals that are like just like not anatomically correct. So. He always gives his monsters snack packs and his uh, animals anatomy. So there's kind of a running joke that if the animal is definitely a boy, then uh, it's a Jason sculpt. Well, the, uh, the dark horse in that particular competition is uh, Bobby Jackson, for sure. Yep, yep, yeah. I think Bobby took that up as uh, challenge accepted. Now they're fighting over the mantle of who can be more anatomically correct. Yes. Who can be more borderline offensive on the miniature? Only for our American sensibilities, probably. So putting a little bit of highlight there at the top. I don't know if I like it yet. I might just bring in some blue liner again and wipe out some of that. It would be overshadowed by this armor piece, so it wouldn't necessarily be that strong. But I wanted something up there a little bit. A little bit of highlight. Knee pads on arm. Obviously, they bend and pick berries a lot in our... Uh... <laughs> it's like knee pads because, well, you're, you're, you know, you're just, you're, maybe they're mopping a lot of floors. Who knows, right? Maybe they get really upset after they kill a monster and they have to stop and clean it. They're just really anal. The, the, uh, the adventurer who just has, like, the OCD of has to clean up after his kills. That would be a great character. And, oh, you would so annoy all the rest of your adventuring party to the hilt. Just a hair off screen there, too. Oh, boop. Ta-da! It's all the zooming. <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm so zoomed in that it's easier to get uh, caught off. Boom. There we go. So a little bit of highlight here toward the top of this crease to just bring that out. So we can suggest that there's more of a crease there than there is. Is it that hard to sculpt knees? Yeah, and our and knees are nasty. Like, it's hard to draw them right, too. Because they're so complicated. And they're not straight. And it's just, yeah. Knees and hands. Elbows are so much easier. There we go. A little bit more highlight. So there we have side butt. Giant side butt. 
exciting. Not so much, but you know. And then we'll just actually, this side, we're right up against the armor. So I definitely want to put in where that armor line is so that I don't waste time painting skin tones up onto it because it's kind of slanted and there's not a real sharp divide here, probably from the molding process. So sometimes you have to make sure that you uh, line. I'm taking blue liner. I'm heavily lining everything that's actually armor because some of this, the skin kind of looks like it's creeping up into the armor and I don't want to waste time. Like this entire thing is an armor plate, technically. You could totally paint it as skin, but it's really not, so you shouldn't have to waste time on it. So blocking in the back of that. All these big, thick armor plates can get a little confusing sometimes. So I like to block in where the shadow, where those plates are to begin with so that I don't waste time. Because really there's only a very narrow strip of skin showing here. The rest of it is all armor armor bulk. So lining beforehand can help you. All right, so uh, why are there adjustable knee models? Oh, because you, you can't just adjust the knee. You have to change the entire motion of the body, and so you can't do that with a static figure. That's why math and file. The minute you make a, a knee twist, everything else in the body moves, which is why when you have knee problems, you also get hip problems, ankle problems, foot problems, back problems, shoulder problems, and neck problems. <laughs> it's, they're very pivotal joints, they are. All of those. Everything interrelates, right? Um, so do we have a raid, Justin, since it is a, a bit late? I didn't quite finish all yeah. of our skin. I almost finished all of our skin, guys, though. That's impressive, right? Yeah. We, we All I didn't get was that last little bit of leg and this hand. Uh, everything else is uh, is skinful. Here, let's uh, let's back up a bit here. Ah, oh no, not zoom. Back out, back out. There we go, and focus. There we are. There's our beautiful bronzy skin tones. Yes, yes, are they? I really like these. I think this uh, I think this color came out really well. And if I was an Anne who still worked in the Reaper paint department. I would immediately distill this skin formula into um, <laughs> and figure it out and make a new skin. <laughs> so yeah, when I'm sitting and just painstakingly layering stuff, that's how I do it. Um, that's how we deal with veins. That's how we deal with dark skin tones. This has been a whole bunch of stuff for you guys this time. And tomorrow, remember, is my last day of the week because we are taking Friday off to uh, go and do, you know, 4th of July lazy things here in this household. Uh, and actually tomorrow, uh, right after stream, I'm going to head up and we're, David and I are going into the mountains to take a hike. Yeah, sorry about buffering and stuff, Twisted Oma. I know that Twitch was a little bit too weird. Yeah, I'd have to figure it out, Kariniko. Usually when, the, when you mix three colors together, this could be really difficult too, because I'll tell you, at least... At least three of these colors have completely different bases, which totally screws you up when you try to to make a color like this. It can totally um, make it almost impossible to remix without so much pain that you just don't ever want to do it. So I may just have to uh, keep it as my secret, super secret dark skin recipe of doom um, that I really like because I, I actually do love the color the way it turned out. Um, I think it's just great. Yeah, I mean, I'll be back tomorrow morning, and then and then we can all just relax and enjoy the fourth, right? Absolutely. All right, so who are we, who are we rating? So, uh, if, uh, we don't seem to have any of our regulars online right now, but we do have Sky Daddy online. Oh, it's, yeah. Uh, she's, uh, we could all use a... some energy. <laughs> there we go. That's absolutely true. She's doing Yennefer from The Witcher. Ooh, ooh, super awesome. Yay, Sky Daddy does body paint art art guys and you should totally watch her because even though she is not a miniature, she is a real real life person. Um where she puts highlights and shadows on her skin as she creates these looks is totally like it's it's the same as you do in miniature painting. So, you uh definitely want to watch her. Plus she's super shiny and bright and cheerful and awesome. Um, so definitely go and say hello to her and, uh, enjoy her stream for a little while if you have time. All right. And I'll see you guys tomorrow morning and, uh, we'll either do dumpster or we'll do fire giant hair. I haven't decided yet. You have a good one. Thanks guys. And we'll see you guys tomorrow morning. Also keep being off. That's important too. See you guys.
That is really good, actually, yeah.